on my seventh birthday, I got my first go-kart. We went out to our local go-kart circuit um, at Newcastle. And I didn't make it past the first corner and I was in the gravel. So my dad had a lot of running around to do, bless him. But um, yeah, I loved it. Uh, then, you know, from that point onwards, it was just a, a family hobby. So me, my brother and my dad, we'd, we'd go karting on weekends and my brother would help pull me along. And, you know, my dad was just amazing and he'd run my brother and myself. And um, like I said, it was just an amazing family hobby. We'd travel, you know, all the way up the east coast of Australia. So, you know, we'd go for 10, 12 hour drives just to get to different car tracks. And yeah, it was it was so much fun. And then you get to a certain age. So for myself, it was around, you know, 12, uh, 13. And my dad comes to me and it's like, you know, karting can get quite expensive at this level that you want to take it now like is this something that you want to do um he's always you know been very honest and he's like because if, if you just want to have fun that's absolutely fine we can just do some club meeting stuff and just keep doing what we're doing it's like, but if you want to go a bit more professional then we've got to invest more time invest more money and and do it as best we can and race against the best in, in australia and I, that's what i wanted to do so i had to quit you know, all my other outside school activities and just focus on karting and show my dad that that's, you know, what I wanted to do. And yeah, that's what we did. He tried his best to, you know, drag me up the, up the coast to, to race in Queensland, Melbourne, wherever we could and in national events, state title events and just give me the experience in karts in Rotax against, you know, the best in Australia at that class at the time. So um, it was an amazing experience and I love go-karts. Absolutely loved it. It was so much fun, but, you know, it was... You know, it's so close, so close between everyone and we had some really great results and, you know, you have some crashes and you have bad results, but I think that's just a part of motorsport. So that's how I got into the competitive side of it. It was just, you know, the support from my father and, and my parents, to be honest. And as like, as a girl, like a little girl in motorsport, at that given time, I, I didn't know any differences. Like when I was seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, I, I, I went racing and, you know, my was with my brother and my dad and with all of their friends, which which were all male. And it would, you know, only be one or two races that I'd, I'd come across another female. But at that age, I, I didn't think I was any different. Like, I couldn't understand why my girlfriends didn't go racing. I didn't, I didn't comprehend it. I was just young and, and enjoying life. It wasn't until I was probably, you know, a little bit older, like 11, 12, 13, where I started to, understand that I was different um, and there was differences in, in karting um, you know by, by being a, a female and um, I was like a essentially like a rarity so there wasn't a lot of us and you'd find when you come across another girl it was amazing because you're like oh there's another one like that's awesome and, and you'd sort of like knit together and be a little support system so that was really great like you, you, you I still struggled with you know um not acceptance and all that sort of stuff at, a, at an early age like it's unfortunate unfortunately it did happen um but I, I didn't realize when i was so young it wasn't until i started growing up and i was like why are they using my gender as an excuse i was like, i don't understand that dad why why is because i'm a girl an excuse for for anything um and that's, you know, when he'd have to pull me aside and just explain, he's just like, to me, it means absolutely nothing. Like, you know, you are who you are and you want to race and that's absolutely fine. But for some people, it, as society grows, it was just it was just different. It was just different. Um, but I've grown to accept that and you, you reach a certain age and it wasn't just, you know, fun anymore. It was com competition. It was, you know, adrenaline. And that's when I approached my dad and I was like, I, I want to do more of this. How, how can we do more? And he gave me that opportunity. He's like, okay, if you just want to have fun, that's fine. But if, if you want to do this work, we're going to do it properly. Um, so yeah, there is a financial burden and we did it as best we could. Um, well, as best my, my, my parents could at that time. So we'd run ourselves. We weren't a part of a team. Like, it was just me and my dad, a go-kart trailer on the back. And um, yeah, he, he'd drive me wherever he could to, to go racing and, and we'd run it out of the, the back of the trailer. I'd be there like changing wheels, axles, you know, I'd be changing engines with dad, whatever I needed to do. I was absolutely like horrendously dirty by the end of the weekend, grease everywhere. Um, and yeah, he, he wanted me to race against the best. And he's always he's always been like that. To be the best, you have to race against the best. So you have to sacrifice things and, and you have to put in the effort. And it was, I think, at the beginning for my parents, stressful because being a, like their baby girl is, you know, starting to to do quite some competitive racing. And, you know, they saw accidents happen. You know, my mum had seen it all from my brother. So, 
she knew what, what was coming and I don't think she was unsure as to, <laughs> as to whether to let me do it or not, but she was never going to hold me back. She knew it was what I wanted to do. So, she, you know, they've all been so supportive. But, um, yeah, I think she's always been, you know, a little bit held back with not wanting to, to let me do it just out of, you know, pure worry. You know, Dad's like, she'll be right, let's go. <laughs> she'll be right. <laughs> and now it's a bit more serious. You know, I think he, he has a bit of worry himself. But... It, it was, yeah, amazing and I'm really thankful for those years because it's really helped me develop as, as a driver and you wouldn't think at 13, 14 you'd be taking so much in, but you do. So to, to have those years of just in the back of your mind and they're just um, really great to have even, you know, five, six, ten years later. You know, like it was me, my dad and my brother and like my brother was engineering me, my dad would mechanic me and then I would drive and there's everyone rocking up in big you know, trucks and teams and it's just us three, like a little group. And it was, you know, it was really empowering to think that, you know, you're then competing against that. And um, that's what we did for our first race. And, you know, I um, could just, you know, put it put it with the guys and put it with the teams and, and we were happy with that. We were, we were able to, you know, mix it and be competitive. And, and at that point, then we started to, okay, let's try and do a bit more testing. Let's try and do, you know, some bigger rounds and, and things like that. And it got to a point where I'd learned so much that this car um, could pretty much teach me um, for, for its, um, how old it was against the, all the new competitive um, cars that were out. So um, we had to make that, that decision whether, same again, we, we, we keep doing what we're doing for fun or, or we've got to do it, we've got to do it properly and race against the best and race against them properly. So, um, yeah, we, we made that decision. Obviously, I knew my answer straight away and it was, <laughs> all right, let's do it. Let's go, Dad. Um, but again, it's another financial burden from, from parents and sponsors and this, that and the other. So at 16, you're running around chasing companies, um, you know, after school, like doing whatever you can just to get the last bits and pieces of budget together. And yeah, we um, did the national championship in Australia for Formula Ford with a team called Synergy Motorsport. And it was the first time I'd ever been with a race team other than my dad and my brother. So that was a big wake up call in itself. I was like, oh, like, where's my brother? Can he not do this? Can my dad not do this? And it's like, no, 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 like, we've got our own mechanic, we've got our own engineer, like, it's all good. And I'm like, okay, this is bizarre. <laughs> and you sort of sit there and it's like, can I do anything? And you know, that synergy was, was really good. It was a really good stepping stone for me to, to get a bit more understanding of, of a team environment in, in motorsport. Because as you keep coming up the ladder, it's like the teams are, you know, the, the most important thing. If you can't get a relationship uh, with your engineer and your mechanic and, and your team boss, then it makes your life a lot, a lot harder throughout that season. So yeah, the first year we just kept on chipping away at it and getting more competitive throughout the field, top 10 finishes, things like that. Um, top six finish, I think was our best finish in that year. And then the second year we, we wanted to go for it. We wanted to, to you know, be, be at the front in the championship. And unfortunately I did three rounds and we ran out of budget. So, you know, at that point in time, I was sitting like eighth in the championship or something like that and we'd had a top five result so yeah it's just all about budget at that at that point in time and I wasn't going to give up so it was unfortunate I loved Formula Ford it was pretty much one of the, the best categories to, to teach young drivers you know you have a H pattern gearbox no slick tires and no aero no grip you just slide it well not slide around but you're moving around everywhere you're always on the limit um, and it's wheel to wheel racing so it, it was you know a great two years to 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 get some experience and yeah I wasn't just going to give up then so I was chasing rides and drives wherever I could and I ended up getting a sponsored um, drive in Australian Formula 4 uh, which was which was great uh, I'd never driven at this point in time wings and slicks before in my life and we pretty much just threw me into a round at Sandown never driven this car before so it was it was hectic, it was insane, and they were already halfway through the championship. So to pretty much just get thrown into it was an amazing opportunity, but you look back and you're like, wow, that was a lot to ask. So um, yeah, we did the best we could, and we ended up with a top six finish, um, and you know we just kept chipping away at it uh, across that weekend, and um, that's how I sort of made my entry into, into wings and slicks. But at, that, at the end of, of that year, um, unfortunately, it wasn't gonna carry on into 2016 um there was just you know 
just wasn't going to work with that um, sponsor that we had on board. So I was left sort of without a drive. <laughs> and then obviously emailing around for sponsorship for, for um, championships in Australia, you know, to try and climb the Australian ladder and, and see what's available. And, you know, I, I also then started spreading my wings and in my eyes, unrealistically started contacting Europe and things like that. And um, you get to a point where you get a bit stuck. And so I'd been doing this for about three months and it was, you know, January in the new year. And I was like, this, we're getting so close to, to a new season. Um, and I ended up getting an email so um, of uh, Thomas Enge, um, the ex Formula One driver from Writer Engineering, um, pretty much stating that they have a junior program available uh, this year in European GT4. And if I was interested in doing it, um, and at first I sort of was like, is this, is this a scam email? Like, <laughs> you know, you don't really know. And, you know, dad was like, well, what's the worst that can happen? Just reply and see what happens. And, you know, we conversed back and forth and found more and more out of the championship, more and more about the team. And, um, yeah, in, in the end, um, I had to make that decision. Like, do I, do I stay in Australia and, and keep hoping for a drive? Or I've, I've got an option here we, we might not have the funding for, but let's just go. <laughs> um, and being fresh 18, it was petrifying, but um, I did it. So I just, I just left home um, and I went over uh, to Germany. Um, and at, at that point in time, like, you know, I was really thankful my, my parents had to do a lot of stuff to make it happen. So we went into, into that year um, with the, pretty much the outlook of I'm racing in Europe. Not many Australian drivers get to do this. Um, you know, I'm pretty sure I'm one of the like the, the first Aussie female driver to to go and race in a full championship in Europe. So um, let's go enjoy the circuits. And if you win, then you'll get another seat, drive in the season afterwards. And if you don't, then it was pretty much a deal. I had to come back and go to university. <laughs> and it was like, you know, we've, we've taken you as far as we possibly can and, unless you can sort something out over there. And I was like, that's absolutely fine. Like, let's just go and do it. And um, yeah, I, I moved to Germany when I was 18 at first. Um, so at first my mum came over with me because she was petrified of sending her 18 year old over. And um, we met the team and um, I got along really well with, with everyone at Writer and um, yeah, my mum left and then I was just staying in like hotels or wherever I could to just keep myself afloat. Um, and then I started, um, you know, working at Writer and I met, that's where I met Naomi and then Naomi and I became good friends and she let me stay at her place. So she sort of, you know, took me out of a hard situation, which was really, really lovely of her. So yeah, we, I ended up living in, in her apartment with her for about a year and a half, nearly two years. And um, yeah, that's when I worked and raced uh, for writer engineering. And yeah, somehow we made it happen. Um, and if you do European, well, if you won that, that junior program from writer, you then got a fully funded drive the year after. So where everything was paid for in, in Blancpain, in, in GT3 and their Lamborghini Gallardo. So um, yeah, I went there with the intention of in the end winning and that's what I did so it was it was a really amazing year a great year um, you know I had a lot of good memories in that car in the KTM GT4 and um, it, it was you know a great team environment to be a part of and, and a great you know junior program initiative uh, so it was yeah it was just I never thought in a million years coming from a, a country town in Australia that then I would be competing against the best GT drivers in the world at like 19 20 years old so um, it was it was a pretty surreal two years to just climb the ladder so quickly, um, but yeah. So that's what we ended up doing. I I won that junior junior scholarship through Writer, and then that pretty much um, snowballs you into GT three the year after, um, and that was in their Gallardo Rex. So that was also just an absolutely mind blowing experience racing in the Blancpain GT Championship. Like they are genuinely the best in my eyes, drivers around the world, you know, that half of them are ex-Formula One drivers, you know, you've got some ex-DTM drivers in there, you've just got so much experience and, you know, so many factory teams, so to be able to compete against that is just, like my dad said, we always compete against the best and that was, like, there was names in there that, you know, I was like, wow, <laughs> this is, this is surreal. 
Um, but yeah, and we went into that both as juniors in into that season, so as silver drivers. And um, the first round at Mizano, we 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 did well, and we ended up on the on the silver cup podium. So we ended up finishing third in, in the silver class, which was really great. And from there, the, the year was just a bit unfortunate, to be honest. Like, um, you know, my, my teammates had a few accidents, um, which put the car out of contention of racing and, and things like that. So um, what was supposed to be like a really big, massive year of racing for me, it didn't really pan out that way, unfortunately, but it's, that's, that's how racing is. So, um, yeah, like I said, amazing experience and, and something I always look back on and be so thankful for Ryder to, to have that program to, to get me that far. Um, but yeah, we just, unfortunately, I didn't get to maximize on it. And that's a part of GT racing. You have teammates and, you know, the races are longer. They're one hour, three hours, six hours, anything like that. So you've got to, you've got to really get yourself into a team environment and, and rotate with everyone. And, um, yeah, I look back and I, I probably got really emotional because I didn't get to achieve what I wanted to achieve. And um, that, that happens in motorsport. So it was mentally challenging for me to pick myself back up and be like, OK, let's just this happens. Let's just keep on going. Um, so, yeah, we, we come away. I think, like I said, I was just um, in a bit of a, of a rut because I, I, you know, I saw it as I had this amazing opportunity and I, and I didn't get to maximize or achieve what, what I wanted to from it um but that's okay um you know things happen um and that in gt racing like you are going to get people that you know um have accidents and you know sometimes you're going to have an accident so it, it all comes back around um it was um you know i just had to keep all right caitlin come on this is not it you've come this far that's literally what i keep telling myself you've come this far like let's keep going we need to keep going um, and I had to leave Germany because my two year visa had come, had expired. So I was like, crap, <laughs> I can't go back to Germany. Um, so what do I do now? Uh, so I decided just to jump ship and go to the UK. And I'd been in liaise, well, the team had been in liaise with me um, about racing in the European Lamborghini Championship uh, with uh, another driver. So uh, we pretty much, again, I just, made a deal with them over the phone I'd never met them in my life and I was like can someone pick me up from the airport at the end of February he's like yeah no worries and I was like get me a place to stay in a job and I'll be there and now I'm living in the UK so my, my dad and my mum thought I was absolutely crazy to do it all again but it's just I didn't want to I didn't want to stay at home I didn't want to get myself into a routine where I couldn't get myself out of I just want to be on the move and I just want to keep pushing to, to me by um you know, trying to take whatever I could and race when I could and race what, whatever um, was just a step in the right direction. So I, yeah, that's what I did. And luckily they picked me up from the airport. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they picked me up from the airport in the UK and I ended up living in a share house in Tamworth in the, in the Midlands um, for the first year of 2018. And I did uh, three races of the European Lamborghini Championship. Um, so I raced with a, a gentleman driver to begin with, which was um, also a new experience for me. So to, to coach someone um, along in their development um, and then also try and bring the best out of yourself at the same time was, was a really good experience for myself and I thoroughly enjoyed it. We raced at Monza and Silverstone and um, it was mega. Those cars were, were awesome, absolutely really loved it. And then. Unfortunately, in the middle of 2018, I, I snapped my fibula. So I just, I'd been in the UK for less than six months and um, yeah, I snapped my fibula and I was in a really bad place, I think, emotionally, because I was like, I've just done all of this and now I've broken my ankle and I can't, you know, they, they'd given me four months or whatever until I was allowed to race again. And I was like, no, that's not gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. And I felt, I sat on my, pretty much sat on my ass for about two weeks and just felt sorry for myself. And then I was like, okay, this is enough. Let's just get up and get on with it. And 10 weeks from the day that I snapped my fibula, I was back in a race car. So I was really, really happy with my progression and just, pushing through that because that that was a tough time. I was stuck, I was I was really stuck. I was living in a share house by myself in the UK. Um, uh, I couldn't fly home to Australia because of blood clots with a, with a cast on, on, your, on your leg and the flight being so long. So I couldn't fly home and, you know, feel sorry for myself at home. Um, and at that point, my parents couldn't really fly over just due to budget at the time. So I just, you know, 
I didn't have many friends. I was actually really quite alone and, and it, that was probably one of the mentally toughest things that I've done is just, I can't work, I can't do anything. Um, I've just got to keep pushing and, and find different ways to keep myself going. And yeah, we, we did it, thankfully. <laughs> only just, only just, you know, it, it, um, it was hard. Um, but yeah, then uh, out of those, those 10 weeks, I, I got back into a race car and I was myself again and really got myself back on my feet. And um, it was a hard one. It was a hard lesson. But um, I, you know, I, I kept saying to my dad, like, I'll, I'll break my ankle any day. I'll go through the pain of breaking my ankle any day. But those six weeks afterwards, no, nah, never again. <laughs> I was like, Dad, this is too hard. <laughs> I was like, this is just mentally too hard. And blessed, like, you, you look back at it and you're like, Caitlin, why? Why did you like? Why did you just put that much pressure on yourself? Why did you, you know, feel sorry for yourself? It's just a broken ankle. Like you're, you're so lucky. That's all it was. Um, yeah. And then the end of 2018 again. I'd done the Super Trofeo things, um, which again required a lot of sponsorship and deals, and that's what I was, you know, trying to work towards again for 2019. But we sort of, I think, with with Brexit and a lot of. Um, you know, things that are going on in the UK to get sponsorship is actually at this point in time really quite difficult um, uh, funding wise and, and being Aussie uh, on the other side of the world, you get a few like Australian companies that are interested and then as they find out you're racing in Europe, they're like, not too sure because we really want to market in Australia and it's like, okay, that's understandable. So yeah, I was sort of really struggling and this is when the W series, you know, the applications came out and everything and um, I went for it like why would you not it's an amazing com concept and um, I'm so grateful and thankful to be a part of this like when when I went to Austria I I didn't have anything lined up I still I still wouldn't if it wasn't for the W series to be completely honest um, and I went there and I remember speaking to Matt Bishop at the time and he wanted to hear my story and I told him my story and you know, moving to the other side of the world by myself and, and doing all those things. And I just turned to Matt and I just said, I was like, I don't, I don't just want this. I was like, I really need it. I was like, I really need this. And we just had that moment and he really understood where I was coming from. And in Austria, we just, you know, I just gave it my all. It was very um, different. You know, I'd never done anything like this before, like, you know, you ended up racing on ice and snow when I'm from Oz, <laughs> you know, um, and you just kept pushing, you know, you just kept pushing through and I had the best, the best week ever to, to meet that many, um, you know, females in motorsport was in itself just really amazing um, and really empowering as well. You, as, a, as a group, everyone was really supportive of one, uh, of one another and we're just pushing each other like we were thriving off each other we were like one person would go quicker and it's like okay let's go again like we were really just pushing each other and it was really great experience to be a part of and I loved it and you know the race of champions you know with everyone and the knockout system oh I loved it it was so much fun I was thriving off it and yeah I was fortunate enough to to prove myself at Austria and get into the next selection process which was in Almeria in Spain and that was my first time, you know, um, taking it back into a single seater in three years and um, in a Formula 3 car. And that was amazing. Um, really, really great. And again, we were fortunate enough to, to show our competitiveness over the three days um, on track at Almeria. And um, I was so grateful to, to make it into the championship. It was like a, it was just a weight had been lifted off your shoulders like when, when your name got called and was like, yeah, you're going to be racing this year. And then it's like, yeah, that's what I needed to hear. <laughs> that's what I needed to hear. So, um, yeah, I'm so grateful to be a part of it. And it's, it's been, to be, to be honest for me, it's been a tough start to the season. I've had a few, you know, a few issues and, you know, a few um, things with my, you know, tweaking my driving to adapt back to a single seater. To be honest, I thought I'd, I'd pick it up quicker than what I have. And, there's moments and outbursts of speed and then I, I'll make a little mistake and it's just, you know, putting it, putting it all together and so we haven't had what I've wanted, uh, you know, in my eyes, not the greatest start, but as a driver you always want better, don't you? You always want more and I, I want to keep, you know, progressing. I, I want to be the best. Yeah, so I want to, I want to do it. I want to do it all. <laughs>